Praise the Lord. It's lovely to see um, new faces. I had the joy of sharing um, this morning, um, bringing the Word of God, and to be back this evening is my privilege. Um, just welcome to you all, and thanks to Stephen and Charlotte, and for Stephen's mom and dad for such a lovely meal, and for Bertie, and for the whole of you all and the elders here. It's a true joy and a privilege, as I said, um, to be here. You can tell um, that my accent's um, not Northern Irish. Um, it's obviously I'm from the black country, which is sort of an area in the Midlands. Um, and so, as I said, yep, it's, it's a privilege to be here. I'm going to have the joy of sharing my testimony with you um, this evening. Time doesn't permit for me to share everything that I would like to share, but um, God willing, in the future, as the Lord leads and opens the door, um, I ho hope to bring a sequel to this. But if you wouldn't mind turning to Genesis, please, as we begin, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. This is going to be our foundation verse this evening, Genesis chapter 12. Just going to read the first four verses. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Amen. And so, Heavenly Father, it is my privilege again to stand in this pulpit and to have the joy of sharing, Father, thy word, and also of your great work in my life, Lord. I thank you so much for your saving grace and your great love, Lord, which reached down into the gutters some 23 years ago and scooped this reprobate from out of it, Lord. And Lord cleansed him, and not only cleansed him, but gave him a new heart and set him at a table, Lord, I thank you this evening that I, Lord, am a sinner that was saved by grace and now stand as a saint, one who has been redeemed. And I give you glory for that, Lord. And I ask tonight that you would help me, Lord, in my weakness, that you might be glorified and that souls might be drawn to the knowledge of thy Saviour this evening, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I've titled this evening's sermon stroke testimony as God's call and faith's response. God's call and faith's response. As I look back over the last 23 years that I've had the privilege of walking with the Lord, every major turn in my life has been marked by the call of God. Before ever I knew the Lord, and at every juncture since coming to him, he has called, and that call has been met by faith's obedience. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed when he departed out of Haran. 
I want to submit this evening that God's divine interventions in my life is not an isolated affair. In other words, it's not unique to my life alone. You can pick up this book and scan its pages from cover to cover and you will see it on the same. God is a relational being, a God of divine interaction. And whenever God determines and purposes to relate to man, he does so with a call, with a call. Moses, Moses, Samuel, Samuel, Saul, Saul. God calls and he waits for faith's response. Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I, Exodus 3 and verse 4, Samuel, Samuel, then Samuel answered, speak for thy servant, hear us, 1 Samuel 3 and verse 10, Saul, Saul, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me? To do Acts chapter 9, verses 4 and verse 6. The Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. I think this evening of the call of God in the life of Simon Peter and Andrew, his brother, in the life of the sons of Zebedee, James and John, I think of the call of God in the life of Matthew, the publican, as he sat at the receipt of custom. I'm wondering this evening, can you tell me what the common thread was that bound their testimonies together? The Lord called, and that call was met with the response of faith. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, follow me. Oh, friends, those two words, those two words change a life. Follow me. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. God's call was met with faith's obedience. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Matthew chapter 4 verses 18 through to 22. Chapter 9 and verse 9. If I was to go around the room this evening, those of you who belong to the Saviour, and I was to ask how it is that you found and find yourself this evening in the kingdom of God. Each and every one of you would have to say that, well, God called. God called. And upon hearing that call, I followed. I can't explain it any more simply than that. You can't learn how to be a Christian. Jesus said, no one can come to me except the Father. Draw them. And when God is at work in a life, he calls. He woos, he draws, he pulls. And our natural response is to meet that call with faith. 
Well, it was no different for me. I was saved at the youthful age of 20 from a life of crime, worldly pleasure, and rebellion. Please don't misunderstand me. I received a wonderful upbringing. I grew up in a stable home. Mom and Dad were married. Dad was a hard-working man. Me and my twin sister were raised with good moral values. Yet there was a seed of rebellion in my heart as far back as I can remember that could not be tamed. No one had ever sat me down and taught me how to steal. But I distinctly recall around the age of seven bringing home an old threepenny piece that I had stole from my class teacher. I saw it, I liked it, and so I figured I would own it. And when I got home, I showed my mom my newfound treasure and explained to her what I'd done. And you can imagine her shock. She took me straight back up to school the next day to give it back. I promised never to do it again. But yet, as I grew older into my teenage school years, my stealing habits multiplied. I helped myself to anything I could find to sell for cash. Musical instruments, laptops, projectors. I was an upcoming DJ in the world of turntablism and records cost money. By the age of 17, I was bent on going to America to make a name for myself in the thing that I loved doing most, scratching records and manipulating the rhythms and beats of hip hop. That was my existence. And yet around that time, I recall receiving vivid dreams I couldn't explain it. I would wake up from my sleep with an impression in my heart of returning back to Sunday school. I would wake with a great burden, though I was steeped in a life of crime. A tremendous burden to find out what is in this book and who this person called Jesus Christ was. You see, as a child of seven and eight, Mr. Gritz, a Native American Indian missionary to the United Kingdom, he would come around the local estate in his minibus, picking us ruffians up and taking us off to Sunday school. It was there where I first heard the gospel message. But that was nearly over a decade ago, and all I ever seemed to do while I was at Sunday school was annoy the teachers with my poor attitude. But brothers and sisters, I could not shake the growing burden to find out what was in this book called the Bible. You see, God was calling. God was calling. Adding to this, when I had just <clears throat> turned 19, <clears throat> A video began circulating amongst friends of an evangelist from New Zealand. This evangelist spoke about the New World Order, the cashless society, the coming of the man of sin. And that got my attention. It per I perked my ears up. But what got my attention more than that was how he spoke of Jesus Christ. You see, all I'd ever known of Jesus in my personal life was religion. Oh, I'd said the sinner's prayer as a youngster, but all I knew was religion. But this man spoke of Jesus as though he knew him personally, as though he was his friend, and it provoked within me to have a desire to know this one as that man knows him. As I said, despite me saying the sinner's prayer multiple times as a child at Sunday school, I did not know Jesus the way this man knew him. And that year marked the exodus, the beginning. The beginning of my exodus from this world of sin and darkness. I was determined to read the Bible from cover to cover in a year. I was an unsaved man, stooped in sin. 
and I did. I was far from being born again at this time, but as I said, I began at Genesis. And by the turn of the following year, I ended in Revelation. There wasn't a single night that passed that I would not be drunk or high on drugs. This is my existence. To my shame, I was one of the local drug dealers on the estate selling drugs to others. Yet over the course of 1999, the Lord took my existence and my life and he took the bottom out of it, turned my world upside down, he began revealing himself to me in ways such that I could not deny his existence. But whilst I felt his pull and him drawing me in his mercy to himself, still I would not bend the knee. I knew what he wanted. He didn't want the sinner's prayer. He didn't want a few religious words fired at him. He wanted me. He wanted my heart, he wanted my will and my life, and I was unwilling to yield it. And you see, when you're stubborn, God has ways of breaking you and ways of pressing you out of measure. I love my sin too much to leave it behind. Yet one night at the turn of the millennia, everything was about to change. Whilst at a friend's house DJing, two men turned up at my house, my mom and dad's, with balaclavas, armed with a sawn-off shotgun. They robbed my mom and dad's house, looking for drugs and cash. And their departing words were, tell your son we're coming back. We're coming back for him. For one whole year the Lord had worn me out. The friends I thought were my friends, they were gone, they failed, they disappointed. The things that I'd put my trust in, even the turntables that I'd built my life around, everything began to fail. And I could no longer kick against the pricks. That night and the incidents of that night was the straw that broke the camel's back. And shortly after, oh, it wasn't with eloquence, but with tears, I bowed the knee. I broke before the Lord and I yielded that stubborn will of mine. And I said, Lord Jesus, you come in. Come and take possession of this vessel Come and ascend the throne of my heart and rule and reign and establish your kingdom in my life. And brothers and sisters, just like that, just like that, I was born again. My whole world changed in a flash. I got rid of the drugs. I sold my turntables. They were my idols. Threw the records in the rubbish dump. And so moved was my then girlfriend, Tiki, who's now my wife, at the change that had come over my life, that she bowed her knee shortly after also to the Lord Jesus and gave her life as well. And the next few months were a whirlwind for us, to say the least. We got saved, baptized and married within the space of a few months. Our friends and family had thought we'd either joined a cult or we'd gone mad. They couldn't understand what was happening. But we hadn't, you see, we'd met with Jesus. Now for many, their entrance into the kingdom of God is where this Christian journey starts and ends. How many times do we hear, well, my name's in the book? as though it's a done deal, that we entered through the gates of glory and now we're to sit and wait for the coming of the king and that somehow God's not to have any further um, interactions with our lives. 
But I want to say this evening that crossing the threshold into Christ's kingdom is only the entry point of a lifelong journey of repeated pattern. And you say, what's the repeated pattern? God's calling and faith's response. You cannot get away from it. We begin in that way and we journey also in the same. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Now I want to draw your attention to verse 4 for a moment and to ask if you notice anything in that verse that might give rise to question. If I was to ask you this evening, well, could you tell me please, from whence did God call Abram? Those conversant with the Bible would say without hesitation, why that's easy. God called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees. I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees in Genesis 15 and verse 7 to give thee this land to inherit it. Yet in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 4, that's not what we read. Instead we read, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Well, the last time that I checked, Ur of the Chaldees is not Haran. It's not. Ur is in Chaldea, that's Babylon or modern-day Iraq. And Haran is in Padan Aram in Syria. You can read that in Genesis chapter 25 and verse 20. Well, as we back up slightly in Genesis 11 and verse 30, verse 31, and Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarah I his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died. He died in Haran. It seems that they began the journey in faith, responding to the call of God, left Ur of the Chaldees, and instead of finding their way into Canaan, they stopped by in Haran. But you see, it seems that they stopped by too long. Tirah, that's Abram's father, never made it into the land of Canaan. He died in Haran. And reading between the lines, it appears that Abram stalled from going the whole way on account of his father Tirah. For after the death of his father Terah, we read in Genesis 12 and verse 1, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of the country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out, when he departed out of Haran. I'm wondering perhaps this evening if some of us here have stalled in Haran when God is calling you all the way to Canaan. It's easily done. I understand that the call of God is never easy and I understand that the call of God is costly. It's costly. 
God said indeed that he would bless Abraham, that he would make of him a great nation, but it came at a cost of him leaving all. I don't know any other way to say it this evening than this, when God calls, when God calls, it must always be met with faith's response. Our response to God in what we will do, in what he has said. I ask you this evening, are you stalling in the area of faith? Is God calling, but you are ignoring? The only way to serve our Saviour is in full, full and yielding obedience. That's the only way. This idea of having a halfway house. You see, Jesus Christ is more real to me than this piece of wood, this pulpit. But friends, you don't get reality with God unless you're prepared to go all the way. This dip the little toe in religion and play around with the things of God, it doesn't cut it. I'd have stayed in the world with the drugs and the drink and the life that I was living. But to have and experience God in a way that is life-changing, to know his presence in your life, you don't play around with God. You yield and you say, yes, Lord, every time he calls. And he reveals himself more and more and more. And more. Follow the journey of Abraham. The only way to serve the Saviour is in full and yielding obedience. Well, with the time that I have remaining this evening, I just want to share briefly just a couple of testimonies that I could share of the many of God's dealings in my life. You remember when I mentioned earlier of the many things that I had stolen prior to coming to the Lord? Well, a number of years into my Christian walk, I heard the call of God. And look, I'd say nine times out of ten when God calls, it's not what we want to hear. Oh Lord, is that you? We know it's him. But it's not what we want to hear. If the Lord would say, well, come this way and I will bless you at no cost, well, that's easy. But so often the call of God is pricely. It costs. It costs. And shortly after coming to the Lord, well, a number of years on into my Christian walk, I heard the call of God to put things right. To put things right. For a couple of years previously, I'd heard the call of God saying the same thing, to put things right, but the personal cost was too great. I reasoned, well, Lord, those offences, those things that I'd stolen, it's under the blood. But then I'd hear him say, well, yes, but your fellow man is out of pocket on account of your sin. And I'm asking you to put things right. Well, the very thought of me doing this, friends, I cannot tell you the struggle of my soul to even bring myself to entertain the possibility that this could be done. The very thought of me even committing it to paper Writing down the things that I'd stolen made my stomach sick. But one day I finally broke under the conviction of God and I began to compile the list. The names of those that I'd stolen from and the things that I had stolen. I want to say this evening that there were things on that list that would have got me locked up behind bars for a very long time. But I knew that God was wanting me to make restitution. And so I did. God's call was met with faith's 
response. I wrote letters and sent them far and wide to previous schools and college, university, companies. I visited people in person. I'll never forget pulling up outside my former school and by then I was a secondary school teacher myself. Pulling up to my former school for an appointment with the deputy head. I remember sitting down in that reception area. I remember pulling up outside the school and thinking I'm mad. But just it was like I went into autopilot. I just got out the car and shut the door. And the Lord just let. I sat down in the reception area, bracing myself to address the deputy headmistress of my offences, which ran literally into the thousands and thousands of pounds. It's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, and I'll never forget that gasp as I began to reel that list off to that lady. She could not believe her ears or eyes. There was no way that I had the means to repay But by then I didn't care. To have a clean conscience void of offence with God and man was worth more to me than any earthly price tag. To get my conscience clean. To get my conscience clean. Well, the outcome wasn't as I had planned. In every single case, barring the police and the insurance company who never got back to me, even though I tried repeated times to get in touch. But everyone else that I had contacted said, we forgive you with no further action required. And I praise God for that. That's testimony number one. I want to close with testimony number two. And I could stand before you this evening and share with you my call to ministry and what God has done there is remarkable and how he has blessed us as a congregation with an old derelict church that had been run down for nigh over a decade, well, 12 years to be precise. But I want to say that the call of God to ministry comes after It comes after being a Christian. And what matters more than anything to me is my personal walk and my personal accountability before the Lord. Before the Lord. And so I'm beginning here. Well, for years as a school teacher, me and my wife had prepared ourselves for the eventual day when I would lose my job on account of my convictions, my faith. I'd watched and prayed as I saw the LGTB agenda sweep into the schools around me, into the nearby schools. At that time, we had a Muslim head teacher. The school that I was a teacher in was about 70% Muslim. And he was a blessing in disguise because he largely kept that agenda out of the school. He didn't want it in the school. He kept it out. However, after his departure, the floodgates were opened and the day came suddenly unannounced that as a form teacher, I would be required in a few months' time to take my form class into an assembly for a diversity session. Now, if you understand anything of these code words, diversity session simply means an LGTB indoctrination session. That's what it basically means. And once again, I felt my stomach churn, and I could tell you of many other accounts, as I recognized distinctly the call of God and the cost that would be involved. Friends, when God calls, it's costly. And naturally and humanly, we take a step back. The call of God is costly. But to obey him, friends, oh, is to go on with God. 
and to experience his blessing. So many Christians do not experience the blessing of God in their lives because God's still waiting for their response. He's been calling for years and still they stall. And God says, until you bend the knee, we're not moving on. You can be a Christian for 10 years going round in, in a circle and God keeps bringing you back to the same point you were at 10 years ago. And he says, are you willing now to obey, son, daughter? God waits for our response. And so my stomach churned within me as I knew what God was calling me to do and I understood the cost that was involved. By the end of the day, having spoken with God in prayer and my wife, I thank God for a supporting wife. At every juncture in my life where God has called, it's implicated us both. And every single time without flinching, she has told me to do what is right by God. And I thank God for her. And that she's not held me back in any of the ways that God has led me and us. Well, I made up my mind to do the only thing that I could do to obey the Lord. He was asking me to make a stand. I understood the cost. I understood. And so I went to see the head teacher with a number of other Christians in the department and I made it clear to him that I could not be in attendance at that assembly and I gave to him the reasons why. At first he was accommodating and understanding. He said no problem. But after consulting HR, It became apparent to him and to us that he could not just leave it. You see, in any other instance, one would be granted leave of absence, no problem. But you begin touching the LGTB agenda and friends, you'll be steamrolled. Matters not your position and influence. I was deputy head of maths with a whole ream of responsibilities. But it mattered not. You stand in the way of that agenda and see what they will do. And I understood this. And so the ball had been set in motion. And heads were about to roll. I'm finishing shortly. For a few weeks after initially meeting with the head, things were quiet. But then as the date drew near, things began rapidly rapidly to escalate. At first, my other Christian colleagues stood with me. I told them, get ready. This is going to cost us our job to stand on this matter. But they didn't believe me. However, when it became apparent that what I'd warned them of was true... I found myself standing alone. Why? Because it wasn't their conviction. You cannot stand for God without a conviction, friends. You don't turn from a life of sin to follow the Lord on a blind whim. Conviction drives the soul of the Christian. That we're convinced, that we're convinced beyond all measure that God, you're in this. And so, Lord, I'm willing to step out. And I couldn't take it out of my heart. God had convict me, son, I've called you. We'd prepared for eight years. We'd lived modestly. We'd taken a small mortgage because we understood one day I would have no job. And that day, eight years on, came. It came suddenly. I found myself standing alone. I was counseled, well, just call in sick, Paul. I told them I cannot. Then they tried to persuade me, well, everything will be fine. Jesus wouldn't make you lose your job. But I looked them in the eye and I told them, listen, I'll jump first, but know this, that at some point you're going to have to follow 
or you're just going to have to sell out Jesus and stay in the workplace and zip your mouth and betray the Lord. But I'm jumping ship. In the two weeks during which this took place, I can honestly say, brethren, that I've never felt the power of God so tangibly in my life than I did back then. It was like God had taken me to another plane. I couldn't explain it. You talk about fear, fear was upon me. The fear of, well, Lord, how am I going to provide for my family? Lord, how this and how that? And I remember one evening just getting alone with God and wrestling this out with him. Being honest in his presence. And I can't explain it except from the crown of my head. The the power of God descended upon me. Brethren, I went from trembling to being bold as a lion. I ran through my house shouting praises and hallelujahs to God. And you could have put a gun to my head that day. And I wouldn't have flinched. Paul said in weakness, the power of God is made known. And I was experiencing that. I was experiencing that. It was remarkable. God gave me the grace to witness to the head teacher with a boldness that I did not naturally possess. To share with him in passion the gospel. He had tears coming down his eyes. I had tears coming down mine. How's it come to this? And then just like that, I was gone. I close with this. I had been in pastoral ministry at that time for five years, shepherding a small flock in Wolverhampton. I figured after my departure that I would join a teaching agency, a supply agency, and look, I could work a few days and The other remaining days, I could devote myself to ministry. Even though on CV it looked commendable, many qualifications, but very quickly the door slammed shut in my face because the reasons of my departure, I chose to resign in the end with immediate effect or I would have been sacked. And because of the things that I had to sign and the reasons of my departure around the whole agenda, I would never teach again in a public school because of that stand. I didn't see that coming. How was I going to pay my mortgage? What was I to do? Well, it was then that I heard again the call of God to step out into full-time ministry. The congregation at that time, you see, I didn't see this coming. Around that time, God had burdened my heart to make the step into full-time ministry, but it was just seemed impossible. How am I going to be able to live? The congregation was only around 15 to 20, modest folk like myself. How would I be supported? How would I live? How would I be able to meet the household needs? But God was calling, and that call was met again with faith's response. Well, on that Sunday when coming home from church, I opened the door to find a large package on the floor. I turned the package over and I read on the back these words, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19. I opened the package wondering what could be in it. And to my surprise and my wife's, there was £5,000 in £20 notes minus a £20. God was at work, friends. It was more money than I'd ever seen in my life. And there and then I set my hand to the plough. And six years on, there's not a month that has gone by that God has not met our family's needs. I can't tell you how, but he does. He does. He does. The only way to experience, I say again, and look, perhaps some of you here are believers and God's calling you. Friends, just step out. It's all I can say. 
just step out. It's like the child on the edge of the settee and the dad just saying, just jump, I've got you. But in the little child's mind, but what happens if I drop? Just jump, daddy's got you. Is daddy going to drop the child? I don't think so. And when God calls you to step out, he's not going to drop you either. He's not. He's got you. He's got you. The only way to experience the supernatural wonders of Christ is to obey the call of God no matter what the cost. Then and only then will you see his power at work. And maybe you're unsaved this evening and you find yourself in this house. And look, I understand the transition coming from the world to Christ. I had many enemies. I had people who wanted me dead. And I understand that when I become a Christian, my own means of warfare, I can't do anymore. And I thought, well, I'm going to be a sitting duck. I'm going to just have written across my head, just come and get me. Free, free tickets. But I cannot tell you how God undertook, how he took my enemies out away. I never saw them again. How he cleared the path and made a, a road for me to walk along. And some of you have got baggage in your life and you're holding on to it and you're saying, well, let me just fix myself up and then I'll come to Christ. Friends, it doesn't work that way. You come to Christ and he'll fix you up. He'll sort out the problems. But you obey him and you embark on a journey that's more exciting than anything this world can throw at you. Drugs, I experienced drugs. Cheap thrill. Hi, today, tomorrow, you're just thrown back into the dumps. But to have true, lasting, abiding peace that this world cannot buy. Friends, you can't purchase that. To be able to lay my head down on a pillow at night and get a good night's sleep, you can't buy that. Jesus will come and he will change you so radically that your friends and family won't recognize you. But you've got to trust him. You step out in faith and say, goodbye world, I'm going. I can't stay any longer with you. Pleasures of sin, I'm gone. Because I'm making my mind to go God's way for the rest of my life. And when you do that, friends, you'll embark on a journey of a lifetime that ends in glory, that ends in eternity, when one day we shall see our Lord face to face and forever we shall be with him. Oh, friends, this is the joy of salvation and the gospel message is simple. That Jesus Christ died for your sins was buried and that he rose again. And that whosoever shall call upon him, he shall come in a real and radical way and save to the uttermost and change you through and through. Amen. Amen. Well, Father, we just thank you this evening, Lord. What can we say? Speaking of things of, of a heavenly magnitude, Father, that eye hath not seen and ear hath not heard. Speaking of glories from another world, Father, that this world knows nothing of. And I pray today for those souls that you may be calling this evening, Father, for those that are sitting on the fence, for those that are looking out and contemplating, Father, jumping, that they cannot find the strength to do it. Oh, God, give them strength this evening to take the plunge, to step out, to put their hand in your hand and to walk with you, Lord, to trust you, to prove you through and through that indeed you are a friend of friends, Lord, and that you will never leave us nor forsake us. I pray that you would extend thy mercy to this congregation. I pray for Christians sitting on the fence. God, encourage them tonight that all is well with their soul, 
that you're not calling them to ruin them, but to bless them and to take them on in your work. And so I pray these things and thank you for the privilege tonight of being able to testify and for your helping grace and hand which has been felt this evening. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen.